Welcome to MythKeeper, my channel exploring the lore and history of fictional universes. This is my first video on my channel, and I wanted to start with the lore and history of the world of Pathfinder. Pathfinder is a role-playing game developed by Paizo Publishing. It spun out of the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons during the open gaming license days of the early 2000s. When D&D released the much maligned fourth edition, Pathfinder was the most popular role-playing game in the world. More recently, in 2019, they released the second edition of their game, and it remains the second most popular fantasy role-playing system after Dungeons & Dragons. But Pathfinder isn't just a game system, it's also a setting. I love the world of Galarian, the setting for the Pathfinder games, and over the last 20 years, I have run or played in over a dozen games in the setting. Recently, I started a game with a new group of players. Some of them were new not just to Pathfinder, but to role-playing games in general. For those new players, I found myself searching YouTube for a video that outlined the history of the Pathfinder world, but I couldn't find anything clear or concise enough to convey the gist of the setting, and especially nothing that distilled the rich history of the world to some key bullet points for viewers to take in. Since I didn't find exactly what I was looking for, I decided that it might be useful for other GMs or other new players if I did just that. So that's what this video is, a 30-minute introduction to the world of Pathfinder and its history. My goal is to keep this fairly high level, but we can dive in deeper to specific places and histories in future videos, if viewers are enjoying this content. If you want to know more about something, be sure to let me know in the comments below. Games of Pathfinder take place in the world of Galarian. Much like our planet Earth, Galarian is the third planet orbiting a yellow sun. The similarities don't end there. The layout of the continents and cultures look a lot like Earth's too, and although there are some adventure paths set all over the world, the vast majority take place in a region called the Inner Sea Region, which encompasses Galarian's version of Europe, called Abistan, and Northern Africa, called Garand. Since this is where almost all of the adventure paths are set, this video will be focused on the history of the Inner Sea Region, with particular emphasis on the empires of Taldor and Cheliax, but we can touch in more detail on other parts of the world in future videos. The history of Galarian spans thousands of years, and is divided into several ages. One of the reasons that Galarian is such a fun setting for a role-playing game is the length and depth of its history. Tragedy, sorrow, and loss define Galarian's history. Cataclysms of various forms have undone cultural and technological advancements, periodically forcing human society into a state of relative barbarism and flux. As a result, player characters in this world will encounter the relics of long-lost civilizations, thousands of years old, whose magic and technology far exceed their own. Two major events stand out among these. An event called the Earthfall, in which a giant meteor wiped out the ancient civilizations of Aslant and Thassalon, and the untimely demise of the god Aradin, who was the promised god of humanity, prophesied to bring in a golden era of peace and prosperity. The current age is called the Age of Lost Omens, and the age is so named because of the failure of prophecy. Now, the failure of prophecy is an intentional choice on the part of the creators of the game setting. No future is carved in stone in this world. Players in the game get to carve out their own destiny and leave their own footprint in the world, for better or for worse. If I had to characterize the world of Galarian today, I would say the current age feels like it would sit somewhere between medieval and renaissance periods in our world. But the radical differences in culture, uh, cultural advancements, the various extents to which magic have altered the lands and people, and other stranger factors at play mean that each adventure path has a very distinct feel and can explore very different themes and stories. In this way, Pathfinder can feel a bit like a kitchen sink setting. Everything is here if you look hard enough, but it's in the richness of that long history that it stands out. Another interesting fact about Pathfinder is that it's a living world. As Paizo releases new adventures, the history continues to be written. The current year in the world of Pathfinder is in fact directly mapped to our own current year. So when I played my first game of Pathfinder in 2009, the game world was 4709. As I record this in the year 2022, the game world is 4722. That's very cool. All right, no more preamble. Let's get into the history of the world. I'll start in the beginning. The first age is called the Age of Creation. The setting is smartly not explicit in its creation myth. The creation of the world is a hotly debated subject among scholars and priests, with as many interpretations as there are philosophies and religion. 
The dwarves, for example, believe that the god Torag created the world at his great forge, striking it again and again with his hammer to get the shape he desired. Others argue that the gods discovered the world of Galarian, rather than having created it themselves, and that their purview is much wider and more expansive than the fate of just one world. Regardless of the creation myth, it is clear that for uncounted ages, mortal life did not exist upon Galarian. Yet this primeval world was not empty. Various extraplanar creatures found their way to Galarian in the time of creation, and would shape the world in the years to come. In the deepest parts of the oceans, the fish-like alien race called the Aboleths ruled supreme, while upon the land, the mysterious and unknowable vault builders carved out vast caverns deep underground for unknown purposes. In the heavens, the gods themselves had a great war, and the terrible world-ending deity called Rovagug was confronted and defeated by an alliance of gods, who it is said cut open the world and sealed Rovagug in a strange dimension at the world's core. After the Age of Creation, before the First Age of Humanity, there was an age called the Age of Serpents. It is so called because among the first of Galarian's great empires was that of the Serpent Folk, whose empire spanned the distance from the Mwangi Expanse to modern-day Cheliax. The rule of the Serpent Folk did not go uncontested, however. In Western Garand and around the Isles of the Shackles, the great Cyclops Empire of the Golgan challenged the hegemony of the Serpent Folk. Also, it is believed that in this age, the Elves first came to Galarian, building the first Ayudara, or Elf Gates, connecting Galarian to the Elven homeland of Severian, which isn't located on Galarian at all, but on a neighboring world. The Elves made their colonies on Galarian in the forests of Kionin in the east and Mirani in the west. Deep below the surface of the earth, the Dwarves formed their first civilizations, but it would be millennia before they would ever discover the sky. Humans existed in this time, but they were hunter-gatherers with no permanent settlements, and humans avoided the lands of the Serpent Folk and the Golgan, who used early humans as slaves for the construction of their ancient dwelling places. The first real date we get is around 12,000 years ago, with the rise of the first human civilization. The year would be roughly minus 7,000 in the Galarian calendar. This date marks the Age of Legend, characterized by these first human empires. Humanity's first civilization would also prove to be its greatest, achieving feats of magic and technology that would never again be eclipsed in the history of the world. This was the continental empire of Asland, a powerful realm of sorcerer kings whose ancient monuments can still be found scattered across the inner sea region today. A second human empire of similar power and mastery called Thassilon also rose near the end of the Age of Legend founded by exiles from Asland, and ruled by wizards known as Rune Lords. But the humans were not without their enemies, and among them were the Aboleths, who had dwelt in the deep places of the world since the Age of Creation. Using powerful magic and cosmic knowledge, the Aboleths redirected a meteor, called the Starstone, to strike at the heart of the Aslanti Empire. This event, called the Earthfall, shattered the world. It destroyed the empires of Aslant and Thassalon, it sliced the conjoined continents of Avistan and Garand in half, and created the Inner Sea. Thus ends the Age of Legend, and begins the Age of Darkness. The Earthfall Cataclysm occurs in the year minus 5293. The damage of Earthfall extends beyond the immediate impact of the collision. Severe weather patterns, earthquakes, and tidal waves ensure that any people that survive the initial impact blast are forced to flee their homes and start anew. Even the Aboleths who set Earthfall into motion have their own cities deep in the oceans destroyed by the cataclysm. Great ash clouds kicked up by the meteor cover the planet, and this becomes quite literally an era of darkness. The Age of Darkness is also characterized by the total collapse of human civilization. Due to the devastation, the Elves retreat back to Severian and won't return for several thousand years. About 200 years after the Earthfall cataclysm, Orcs emerge onto the surface of the world, finding a dark and welcoming world, akin to the darkness of the deep tunnels and caverns they left behind. They conquer the land now known as Belksen, and make it their homeland on the surface. Just before the end of the Age of Darkness, the dwarves too emerge onto the surface, fulfilling what they call the Quest for the Sky, and establish their fortresses and sky citadels in the Five Kings Mountains and the Mindspin Mountains. The Age of Darkness is considered to end in minus 4294, 
when the sky is finally clear of the dust and debris of earthfall. This period is called the Age of Anguish, because although humanity began to rebuild its civilization, earthfall had sent them back to the Stone Age, and it was a slow, difficult crawl back to farming settlements and small townships from the harsh survivalism that had characterized the Age of Darkness. During this period, the planet of Galarian wasn't the only place in the cosmos suffering at this point in time. Existing in another plane of reality is a realm of the Fey, also known as the First World, where Fey creatures like dryads, nymphs, sprites, and other fairy types dwell and make their home. During the Age of Anguish, the First World suffers a terrible catastrophe, and it forces the fey creatures to flee their homes. Most notably among them are the gnomes, who flee to Galarian in great numbers in this period, becoming one of the more common peoples of the inner sea region. Before the end of the Age of Anguish, humanity makes significant progress towards rebuilding civilization in various parts of the inner sea region. In northwestern Garen, the Jiska Empire is established. In the western reaches of the Mwangi Expanse, a powerful wizard named Jetembe establishes the Magambaya Academy of Arcane Learning. Despite these two significant milestones in humanity's return to prominence, the Age of Anguish isn't considered to end until minus 3470, when the Empire of Ancient Assyrian is founded. This begins the Age of Destiny. It starts with Ancient Assyrian, the Galarian analogue for Ancient Egypt, situated in the northeastern end of Garand. In this period, human civilization flourished in northern Garand with the Jiska Empire in the east, the Tekertanen League in the center, and Osirian in the west. In the south, the power and influence of Magambaya would lead to the establishment of a powerful southern empire called the Shori Empire. By minus 1452, the Jiska Empire collapsed and Osirian annexed the Tekertanen territories. Osirian and the influence of its pharaohs would also start to decline a short while later. The power of these early human civilizations waxed and waned considerably in this period. Minus 1281 saw the founding of the second most influential empire in the inner sea region, second, of course, to the ancient Aslanti Empire. This would be Taldor, situated in the southeastern corner of Avistan. Taldan mythology tells of the infant Taldaris, who was raised by wild lions on the Tendak plains, where even as a youth, he is said to have performed extraordinary tasks, such as beheading a threatening cockatrice with his bare hands. As a young man, using his skill in battle and his tactical prowess, Taldaris began a twelve-year-long war conquest that culminated in the establishment of the first unified Avistinian Empire since the Age of Darkness. Like Osirian, the Taldan Empire has a real-world analogue. The Taldan Empire is like the old Roman Empire, and in time, it will swallow up most of southern Avistan, reach far to the north, and even spread south into places like Garand. Because of its power and influence, the language of the empire, Taldan, is the lingua franca in most parts of the inner sea region, and it's the language that in other D&D settings would often simply be called common. As Taldan influences wax in this pre-medieval world, the influence of Assyrian continue to wane. Their empire shrinks significantly when the lands previously belonging to the Tekertanen League claim their independence. The Shori Empire also collapses in minus 632 when a giant monster called the Tarask ravages that part of the world. By minus 43, a new empire emerges just south of Taldor called Kadira, beginning a border struggle between the two empires that remains unresolved even to this day. Humanity's new calendar would begin starting years at year zero, when a miraculous event performed by a legendary figure would shape the inner sea region. This man was named Aradin, and he was known by several mythic titles, including the last of the first humans and the last Aslanti, because he was ostensibly the last full-blooded Aslanti to ever live on Galarian. In the year zero, Aradin traveled to Taldor, and from there he took a ship out to the heart of the inner sea the very center of the largest impact crater from the Earthfall event. Deep in that sea-filled crater, he found the heart of the meteorite, the Star Stone, and when he held it, it filled in with magic, and somehow through this magic, he was able to raise the seafloor up to the surface. This created the island of Kortos and the city-state of Absalom, the greatest city in all the world. Around the Star Stone was erected the Star Stone 
cathedral, standing on a stone column in the center of a wide and seemingly bottomless pit at the heart of Absalom's central district. The star stone remains protected inside, and legend states that any who should touch the stone, like Aradin himself, would be immediately ascended to godhood. This event marks the beginning of the Age of Enthronement, and from here on, the years count upwards. It is named the Age of Enthronement because it is from here on out that Aradin ascends to his metaphorical throne, godhood. Aradin is proclaimed the patron god of humanity. For a period, Aradin is a living god, remaining on the mortal world to steer humanity. But seers and prophets in these times proclaim that someday soon Aradin will ascend to the heavens, but also not to fear, for he will return to the mortal world to usher in a golden age of peace and prosperity for all mankind. As the seers predict, in fact, before the end of the fourth century, Aradin removes himself from the mundane affairs of Absalom and of the world of Galarian and shifts his focus instead to his growing divine domain in the heavens. Although not all of humanity begins to worship Aradin at this point, so much of it does so that it could be considered the ubiquitous faith across most human civilization in the inner sea region. Most notably, the Empire of Taldor adopts worship of Aradin as the official imperial religion, and with their zealous belief in the promised destiny of a unified future for humanity, Taldor expands rapidly in this period. By the year 500, Taldor spreads so far north that it wraps around Lake Incarthen and reaches the orc lands of Belksen. This region will be the source of much conflict in the years to come, not just because of warring with the neighboring orcs, but also due to the emergence of a powerful wizard king in the region named tar -Bafon. tar -Bafon comes into power in the area around Lake Incarthen in the year 861, with his first conquest being the Isle of Intepper, later named the Isle of Terror, at the center of Lake Incarthen. Here, tar -Bafon unlocks necromantic secrets and ancient power from the remains of one of the room lords of ancient Thassalon. With an army of raised undead and recruited orcs from Belksen, tar -Bafon begins to conquer Talden lands. Such was tar -Bafon's power that it attracted the attention of the god king himself, and Aradin slew the wizard king on the Isle of Terror in a mighty battle in 896. After the death of tar -Bafon, although tar -Bafon's conquered lands of Ustalav would remain independent, apart from this, Taldor would continue to expand its territory stretching as far west as the Arcadian Ocean and as far north and east as Iobaria. By 1532, the Kalashite Empire of Kadira had also begun expanding, spreading westwards and conquering the ancient lands of Osirian. In the early 2000s, Taldor makes several attempts to spread south into Garand via the Hesperth Strait. These southern crusades largely prove unsuccessful, although they do have a lingering legacy. The collision of Aradin worshipping Taldans and Sarenrae worshipping Thuvans and Kadirans have a lasting impact on the region, eventually encouraging the founding of Rahadum in northwestern Garand in 2555, a nation in which no gods may be openly worshipped. Finally, in 2632, almost 8,000 years since the elves left Galarian during the Age of Darkness, the elves returned to their kingdom in Kionin, reclaiming those forests and returning to the world. The elves that return also learn that some elves had remained in Galarian, and they call these elves the Forlorn. After being separated from their kinsfolk for thousands of years, the returning elves find these Forlorn to be socially and culturally quite removed from the rest of their kind. They never fully reintegrate, even to this day. Taldan expansion continues throughout this period, and by the year 3000, the Taldan Empire occupies all of modern-day Andoran and Chelyax. Almost a third of Avistan is now a part of the Taldan Empire. Their hegemony is almost supreme, bordered by Numeria and Ustalav in the northeast, and by the Zonkuthon worshipping nightmare nation of Nadal in the northwest. Then, in 3203, tragedy. Tar Bafon return, returns to the world, somehow resurrecting himself as a lich and retaking Belksen and half of Ustalav. This marks the beginning of an almost millennia long conflict with the lich tyrant. By the time of tar -Bafon's return, Aradin himself is almost completely removed from the affairs of mortals, and although he does eventually get involved, almost 500 years into the conflict, he does so by delegating the intervention to his herald, the demigoddess Arasni. 
She is ultimately humiliated and slain by the tyrant in 3823, who, in an effort to demoralize his opponents, throws her broken body back to her knights during the Battle of Three Sorrows. Despite Arasne's death, Taldor continues to fight. An order of paladins, dedicated to the worship of Aradin, name a skillful young knight named Iomede to lead their ranks. She and a Taldan general named Arnesent are able to fight the tyrant using a pair of artifacts called the Shield of Aradin and Iomede's sacred sword, the Heart's Edge. Although they aren't able to completely destroy the Lich, they are able to bind it beneath the Hungry Mountains in the depths below his old fortress of Gallowspire. A year later, in 3828, the Nation of Last Wall is formed to maintain a constant vigil against the possible return of the Whispering Tyrant. Four years after this, Iomade ascends to godhood herself, and she becomes the new Herald of Aradin, replacing the fallen goddess, Arasne. In 3890, in Eastern Garand, Arasne is eventually resurrected as a Lich Queen and ruler of the Nation of Geb, which has been at war with its neighboring nation, Nex, for thousands of years. She remains one of the most interesting mythological figures in the game world. Things look quiet for a short while, but in 4079, tensions flare up again between Kadir and Taldor, an open war erupts along that southern border once again. Resources from all across the empire are pulled into the war effort, and this creates a political divide between the more distant parts of the empire and those closer to Apara and the traditional Taldan lands. A few years into this new war with Kadira, with southern attention being diverted towards fighting the enemy, the empire of Taldor splits in half, akin to the eastern and western split of the old Roman Empire. The traditional Taldan lands remain Taldor, but north and west of the Five King Mountains, the remaining lands become the empire of Cheliax. Effectively, this becomes the successor state to the larger portion of the old Taldan Empire. Cheliax, no longer needing to fund Taldor's long-standing war with its southern rival, focuses instead on expansion and conquest northward. They call this the Everwar Expansion, and it begins in 4305 with the invasion of Nadal, and it ends about a hundred years later with the completed conquest of Corvosa and modern-day Malthun and Nirmathus. Chaliax also establishes colonies in Garand, including the conquest of the Shackles and the colony of Sargava. At this point, it rivals the scale and power of the old Taldan Empire at its height. The influence of the rest of Taldor wanes as it continues to expand all its resources on its ongoing war with Kadira. Meanwhile, in 4576, the city of West Crown in the heart of Chaliax, a man named Dadian Rule forms a vigilante posse to capture and kill members of a demonic cult responsible for a series of murders called the White Plague Murders. This group of vigilantes become known as the Order of the Gate, and they are the first order of Hell Knights who turn to following the guidance of the Dark God Asmodeus and reject worship of Aradin. Crucially, for those of you that already know some of this history, this occurred 30 years before the Death of Prophecy and the Chelish Civil War. The Hell Knight order predates the Asmodean Ascendancy and the Ascendancy of House Thrun. I highlight this because it's an overlooked detail in the history, and although they owe fealty to the same god as House Thrun, they have a very different lineage and heritage, and they don't always see eye to eye with them. All this brings us to the fateful date, 4606, roughly a hundred years before current day. This is the day that prophecy dies. The Starfall Doctrine, the most important prophecy in the Aradonite faith, marked 4606 to be the day that Aradon would return to the mortal world and usher in the promised Age of Glory. Not only did the god not appear, but the very power of prophecy, which had defined Aradon's life and spurred his personal accomplishments and ambitions, stopped functioning. At this appointed hour, Galarian was racked with three weeks of storms and earthquakes. In western Garand, a terrible maelstrom called the Eye of Abendego opened up, where it remains in perpetuity today. In the north, a terrible rent in the fabric of real space opened up called the World Wound, and from it, legions of demons spilled forth and raided the land around them. When the cataclysms finally began to subside, the clerics of Aradon found they could not reach their god. With his divine mandate removed, and the promise of a united humanity proven untrue, the empire of Chaliax fell into both the religious and civil war. From 4606 to the current year of 4722, we call this period the Age of Lost Omens, 
This is the current age of the world. The Chalish Civil War lasts for 34 years, from 4606 to 4740. The Chalish Civil War is one of the defining features of the modern age. The war is won by the House of Thrun, an ancient Chalish noble house with lineage that could be traced back to Old Taldor, who practiced diabolism and worshipped the infernal god Asmodeus. In order to win the war, they required the support of the old rulers of Nadal, offering to return them to power and return their nation to independence for their support. Though Thrun won, they lost the territories of Isgur, Nadal, Malthun, near Mathis, and the greater Corbosan holdings in the north. Despite those significant losses of territory, Thrunish control of Chaliax became brutal and absolute, outlawing specifically the worship of Iomade, who in Aradin's absence inherited much of Aradin's form of worship, so much so that this goddess is still called the Inheritor today. The more oppressive House Thrun becomes, however, the harder it becomes for them to control their outlying territories, and the more that resistance starts to galvanize against them. The Empire of Chaliax begins to lose territory, starting with the nation of Galt in the furthest reaches of the Empire in 4667. This is followed by Andoran in 4669, and finally the Shackles become an independent nation-state of pirates, ruled over by a pirate king in 4674. From 4674 to 4722, the last 50 years to present day, there are some other minor shifts in borders and nations, but broadly the inner sea region starts to settle into this new reality. The great promised empire of mankind is not only a shadow of its former self, but it remains a cruel and imperialist nation, now even more so that its leaders openly worship one of the lords of hell. The future is unknown and uncertain, and while there are a great many threats to peace and progress, there's also a lot of hope and potential. The death of prophecy is a scary time for many, but it can also be a boon. For the first time, the free people of Galarian can take stock and ask themselves, what kind of people do we wish to be? What kind of nations do we seek to build? It's a perfect setting for a role-playing game. Enjoy the ride. Thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard today, be sure to like and subscribe, and let me know what you'd like to know more about in the comments